Welcome to 2050. Boarding a flight to Santiago. Proceed to gate 4E to board your 787. To Heathrow, that will be 5F on an A350. In the future, with fuel prices soaring due to scarcity of oil and stiff competition between airlines on who can offer the lowest cost per seat, filling every seat on board every flight is the recipe for survival. Enter a new era of aviation, powered by densified 8350s and 787s. Now let's rewind a little bit. The 8350 and 787 are of course the newest generation currently of large white body airliners with their newest generation of engines, new wing and fuselage. The key selling point of both is their efficiency, with Airbus promising 25% low fuel burn and Boeing a more modest 20% against the previous generation of airliners. Given they are only most recently introduced, the 787 entered service in 2011 and 850 in 2016, these are still the newbies to the world's airlines, a glimmering new bird amongst all the other 777s, 8330s, 8340s and and so on, so forth. However, the aviation industry is always dynamically evolving, and so are airlines' demands. Airlines all over the world are now eyeing one word. Profitability. The aviation industry is a tough battleground, and COVID-19 has shown just how vulnerable it is, especially for one genre of flights, long-haul travel. Demand for the long haul rockets and plummets, while domestic short haul flying does still stay pretty predictable. On long haul flights, squeezing that tiny bit of operational cost out is key to ensure profitability, not least given long haul flights are most affected by fluctuations in oil price. Given budget airlines are now trying to go long haul, this puts more strain on the world's largest international long range airlines. Think Turkish Airlines, Emirates, Qatar, and many others. That's why the 8350 and 787 will not simply be just the most efficient available but will become the default for all long range travel. In the 2000s, the backbone of the long haul fleet comprised of two aircraft, the A330 and 777. Back then, these two were dominating the skies on most long haul routes. Till today, they are considered relatively efficient, with constant updates made to keep them on par. But airlines aren't buying 777s or A330s anymore. Hundred and thirty six seven eight seven were sold to airlines. Between those five years, only one hundred eighty five triple sevens were sold, and this figure includes the freighter and new triple seven X version as well. I chose these five years given it is out of the launch period of any new variant within these families. 
Demand for the 8330 and 777s have fallen with the introduction of these new generation airplanes. This is especially true given that airlines operating these new generation airplanes would instantly be at a competitive advantage against other airlines which do not, either in terms of higher profit margins or being able to offer more generous fares and ticket prices to passengers. At the end of the day, passengers would rather pay less to fly than pay more to enjoy more comfortable flights. Furthermore, with increased awareness of climate change, new environmental laws such as carbon taxes may be rolled out, and lower carbon emissions of the new 8350 and 787s would reduce the tax airlines have to pay. With so many advantages, it's hard to see why airlines will not choose either the 787 or 8350. As engine technology improves over time, both Airbus and Boeing would continue to optimize. These two new airframes are also the newest platform for future engine technologies, while 777X and 8330 Neo are the final chapters of their aircraft families. However, there is another trend here. The best-selling 777 was really the Dash 300ER version. Thanks to its high capacity and long range, it could replace most 747s with a slightly denser seating layout, closing the gap. The best-selling 787 and 8350 models though are not the largest, but the medium-sized versions, the Dash 9 and Dash 900. Instead of choosing larger aircraft, airlines are now choosing to fly with smaller airplanes. Triple seven dash three hundred ERs are regularly swapped with A three fifty dash nine hundreds, an airplane that's supposed to be from the class below. Take Singapore for example, which now operates A three fifty dash nine hundred to Manchester regularly on what used to be a triple seven dash three hundred ER flight. Why is that? Smaller aircrafts are simply more flexible. In the future, every seat counts, and airlines realize that being able to fill every seat is far more important than offering more seats to travelers. The future of flight will see 290 to 350 seater airplanes take off. Furthermore, it's hard to ignore the advancement in seat technology since the early days that has allowed the gap between the larger sized airplanes with an older generation of seat and smaller airplanes with newer, more dense cabin layouts to close the gap. In the 90s to 2000s, the average pitch on board the 777 and A330 was around 33 to 34 inches. Now, it's 32 inches if you're lucky and fast becoming only 31. How is that? Well, take a look at modern seats. Slim backs with the traditional seat pocket containing a literature pack replaced with a thin pocket for your items. Menu cards are now gone. This reduces the bulkiness of in-flight literature packets. So in a seat pocket, there is a and those can now be moved to a separate compartment as seen on many airline seats above the tray table. The tray table itself has been raised to clear space for passengers' knees. Put it nicely, it's called better optimization of space, put crudely, and it's called skinning the cat. It's not just the distance between rows getting smaller, but the width too. Airline seats were at the widest when 777s first carried passengers at 18.5 inches with wider aisles. Now though, you would be lucky to get 18 inches on an A350. 
airlines and manufacturers have been shrinking galleys, combining galleys with toilets, and using rear pressure bulkhead space for galleys, or to maximize usable cabin length for the most number of seats. Combine all of this, and here are the results. When the Dreamliner was first introduced, it had a range of 8,500 or so nautical miles and was intended to be a smaller, lower capacity aircraft of around 200 to 250 seats in a typical three class layout to fly 8,500 nautical miles. Back then, the aircraft was intended to take only eight abreast, not nine. When it became clear that such an aircraft would have higher fuel burn per seat, Boeing was forced to increase seat count and moved to 9 abreast. This increased the number of seats from the intended 250 to 290. Today, airlines can configure up to 300 or more seats on board a 787-9. It's a similar story with the A350. Initially intended to take 314 passengers when first launched, the Dash 900 now markets itself as taking 325, but airlines typically go above even that, with the highest being around 340 or so seats, while seat width has fortunately stayed the same, Airbus has been in recent years years more aggressively marketing its 10 abreast economy class. It's not hard to project that in 10 to 20 years, 10 abreast on board 8 or 50 could well become the norm, just as how 10 abreast gradually made its way into the 777 fleet. Airbus is working to improve 10 abreast with 17 inch seats in 10 abreast. the A350 would seat even more passengers, firmly establishing itself in the 375 to potentially 380 seat category. Given 10 abreast would give the A350 an additional 30 to 40 or so seats. Pretty cramped, but on par with most 777-300ERs today. Really, Airbus pretty much predicted how the future of flying long haul would look like and how future widebody aircraft will be configured during a recent market forecast press conference. And uh, in fact, I think we will see some, some large aircraft and some densely configured aircraft be uh, used for many time, many years to come. Densely configured aircraft will become more common, lowering seat costs while increasing passenger capacity, allowing smaller airplanes to replace older larger ones. From an airline's point of view, densely configured aircraft is a double win. Should there be high demand, more seats can be filled and the fuel cost per passenger would plummet. And even if not all seats are filled, these new generation airplanes still have a lower trip cost than today's airplanes. The trip cost of an A350-900 or 787-9 compared to say a 777 of similar size is down by at least 30%. And if configured densely to squeeze in the same number of seats, the fuel cost per seat could be cut 40%. Given the prospects of such numbers in a future where each percentage point in cost reduction matters more, each less gram of carbon produced per passenger weighs more heavily, where airlines compete for greater profits or lower fares by the cent, it's easy to see why densified medium-sized white bodies, 300-seater 787-9s and 380-seater A350-900 could well be the future of long-haul travel. Remember the days when 777 started to replace 747 in the 90s? Many were speculating about replacing a larger aircraft with an inherently smaller one. Boeing upgraded the performances to match the range of 747 and closed the gap in capacity, and here are the results today.
Now though, it's the larger 777 wide body that faces competition from a new generation of smaller and lighter airplanes, which with a densified cabin layout would close the gap in capacity. The 8350 and 787 mark the start of a new era in aviation, with densified cabins carrying passengers cleaner, quieter and greener more direct to their final destination. Welcome to the flight of the future.